uh, there are millions of different insects I could have covered today. I did list that Pat that sort of turn, m m meshes with her presentation as far as diseases and, and vectors of disease. So we're talking about Asian citrus psyllid and glassy wing sharpshooter, the similarities and diff dis di differences. And I'm going to just throw in olive psyllid and olive fruit fly because people seem to be surprised when they see this if they start trying to grow olives. And uh, ficus gall wasp and ficus white fly are two new pests that are in LA that came up about two weeks ago. And red palm weevil and South American palm weevil, as well as gold spotted oak borer and polyphagous shot hole borer, which are local borer issues. And about ACP and GWIS is that they're both detected by this non-specific yellow sticky trap called the YP trap. And we get a lot of these. They're held at nurseries or in residential neighborhoods. And this is how we're detecting ACP. If you'd like to do a test of your good eyesight, this is, this is a, a, an Asian citrus psyllid trap, that, an example of what we receive um, hundreds of in the lab every day. And you can look to see all the things that fall on the Asian on the Asian citrus psyllid trap. And then when you put the cover down, where the holes are drawn is where the Asian citrus psyllid is. And this is a really good test. We have to go get re-tuned up um, at the CDFA to be sure that we can uh, read these traps because the Asian citrus psyllid is so small. So go ahead and, and try your, your visual acumen. We do use uh, magnification, of course, to, to do these readings. Um, and, and the GWIS are also collected off of these traps. So I'm sorry, it's gr I didn't realize the gray was going to be so dark in here. But I wanted to show you. I'll get it. I'll get it. <laughs> okay, this is glassy wing sharpshooter. Um, the vector of Pierce's disease in grapes, oleander, and other things that Pat's going to be talking about. And they've been doing a research on this uh, Pierce's disease from since about year 2000. But there's still no cure for Pierce's disease. And uh, this is the egg mass that you will see usually often in citrus on the underside of citrus leaves. And they um, generally have a white powdery substance. It's kind of like an antimicrobial that the mother puts around the eggs. And then this is uh, Asian citrus psyllid eggs are only found on the feather flush of citrus trees. So if you're ever out there and they recommend you check every month at least for Asian citrus psyllid, of course I expect you guys to check more often. Um, and their little almond shaped eggs, oh, probably a millimeter, if not smaller, maybe a fifth of a millimeter I think, I'm not sure. And they're on the feather flush, but ACP's a host list is much more specific. It's on Rutaceae. They do say that it's on fig, but I'm not exactly sure. We haven't seen any of that. And the problem with Asian citrus psyllid um, is that it spreads Wang Lung uh, Bing disease, which was, Pat will tell you about, it was a bio-terrorist uh, agent until about, it was called the, it was on the Homeland Security <coughs> Select Agent List until 2007. So re researchers really couldn't sink their teeth into it until 2007. So that's how far the disease is uh, behind um, Pierce's disease. So how and do you we, define feather flush? It's the very, very tips of the, of the citrus plant uh, when it's new growth, on its new growth. And that's the only place the Asian citrus psyllid mother will lay eggs. Oh, okay. So that's where to look in the fine new growth. Okay, and GWIS is a vector of, as I said, uh, Pierce's disease, xylella fastidiosa, and it's in the xylem. 
ACP is a vector of Candidus liberibacter, also called, called Wang Lung Bing, or citrus greening disease, and it's that disease is carried in the phloem. That's the difference between those two guys. But otherwise, a lot of um, <coughs> their, these are a close-up of the eggs again, and they feed differently, even though they both have piercing tubes that stick in, of course, the um, Pierce's disease vector sticks into the xylem, and the ACP sticks into the phloem, and they have different feeding positions. This, the, the glassy wing sharpshooter is horizontal to its substrate, and the Asian citrus psyllid has a characteristic 45 degree angle to the substrate because of how their mouth parts are positioned. And so one way to check, they're so minute, which you will see when you look at the trap. Um, when you're good at it, you can see that they will stand 45 degrees to the stem. They're minute, though. They're only two to three millimeters. Uh, Gwis, on the other hand, is really fun to watch because as you go approach it, it will go around the stem and try to hide and then go around the other way. <laughs> it's really they're cute. Fast. And they're fast, yeah. yes. So Pierce's disease is well known in the southeast United States, and it's spread, it's, it exists in many places. But the idea is to not spread it with the better vector, which is um, a hot, better flyer and can enter into the center of uh, grape orchards. Unlike the native one that they have in Northern California, the native vector in, in Napa Valley tends to just spread the disease around the edge, from riparian environments to the edge. But GWIS, because of its strong flight attribute, goes into the middle of, of the orchard and spreads the disease much more. So in San Diego County, in here you have the blue parts of the state is where GWIS is present. And there's a quarantine in the state of California not to ship GWIS north. So every load of plants that we send from San Diego County is inspected for GWIS, GWIS eggs, and it's sprayed with a pesticide. We know which nurseries are most infested by our yellow panel trap trapping, and they get treated accordingly. If they're GWIS-free, they don't need to spray. If they have a lot of GWIS, they need to spray, that sort of thing. So. Um, we get a lot of funding from the grape industry for our GWIS program. That's what keep, pays a big part of our salaries to make sure that we're not shipping anything up there. Now, Wang Lung Bing, I want you to just scan this map. It's, uh, you know, mainly in Asia. And along with that, this is the distribution of the Asian citrus psyllid. And you can see that they are very close overlap. And so we are in the middle of the war not to have uh, Wang Lung Bing spread into California or get spread around California. And um, this is the map of Asian citrus psyllid finds plus the Wang Lung Bing find in LA. LA Wang Lung Bing is that little green dot there, but it's the only find of the disease in our area, in the United States. In California, if Florida and Texas have it. Now, the other dots, and this is not an up-to-date map, are all the finds of Asian citrus psyllid. And what's happening now is that because the population is so robust in LA, Riverside, San Bernardino, Orange, they have pretty much given up treatment. They have lost it. And only commercial citrus groves are treating, or encouraged to treat. In San Diego and Imperial County and Ventura, they are still treating within a certain radius, 100 meters around each find, and commercial groves are still treating. How widespread is the disease in Florida and Texas? Is it We'll, we'll get to that. It's, okay. it's pretty widespread in Florida. In it's Texas, it's still fast. fairly isolated. But Florida, it's bad. It's all over. Yeah. 
since what, 2006, I think it was first in Florida, found in Florida and it's spread statewide. Um, this is a close-up, and this isn't even up to date on where our most recent, as in two weeks ago, finds in San Diego County are. And uh, there are pockets in Fallbrook, Rainbow. It used to be just under Route 8 that we had Asian citrus psyllid. And there are finds north of 8 in El Cajon area. There's some in Oceanside. There's a pocket in Escondido now that's only one find. Uh, there's a pocket in Valley Center, pocket in Duluth. So there, we're finding, as of the last month, we're finding many more in North County. And it feels like it's slipping away on us, uh, as far as control. Um, oops. Okay, switching gears. Does everybody know what the olive psyllid looks like? Just, no. There's a lot of people that call up and say, what's wrong with my olives? I have this white fluffy stuff all over the stem. And in that white fluffy stuff is a whole colony of, of olive psyllids, adults, uh, nymphs, and eggs. And that's where they live. And, and they suck the juice out of the olive branch. <clears throat> it's a new pest as of a few years ago. And so people who try to grow olives are going to see this pest. They're also going to see the uh, olive fruit fly, which you can see has spread throughout the state. And the um, maggots are inside the olive when you see a little sting mark. The fly stings. This is a picture of the fly stinging. And there are these little tiny punctures on the, on the olive. And you know by looking at that, that when you split open your olive, you're going to see some larvae. So don't be surprised. So that's only been on fruit-bearing olive trees, exactly. not the Exactly. If you're going to try to grow olives, you'll find these, definitely. Yep. And how is it combated? Right. Well, um, there are university um, trials and information on the UC IPM website that are very good and it basically has to do with spraying every week during the time that the olive is on the tree and um, the thing that growers have to deal with is that this this olive fruit fly really loves big fruit and uh, the parasite that they're trying to use on the olive fruit fly is loves small fruit so they're kind of you know it's just but um they're working on biological controls but right now they have a, a recommendation for using spinosad pretty much every eight days during growing <coughs> Okay, and is the olive psyllid on non-fruiting olives too or is that one just for fruit? that can be on any olive mm -hmm. yeah fruiting and non-fruiting with all the spinosad, what about the bees? I'm not sure what the regulations are. You'll have you'd have to look at the recommendations. It's on the UCIPM website. Okay, a new pest as of about three weeks ago in in uh, LA County, not San Diego County, but you all should be out on the lookout for this one. And these two, actually, one of them is a um, ficus gall wasp, and it's hard to see, I'm sorry, but there are a lot of little puncture wounds in the skull. And uh, wasp exit holes, and, and you will see the um, swollen stem. It looks like a willow gall. It looks like willow stem gall, but it's on uh, ficus. And then the white fly is on the leaves of the ficus. Most, the most common ficus that we get shipped in here from Florida, I believe. Um, I forget what the ficus is. But Benjamina? It's, yes, Benjamina. It loves ficus Benjamina. So you might be seeing this now. Okay, let's go to palm weevil. And I want you to just kind of pool, you know, red palm weevil and South American palm weevil together in your head because their biologies are very similar. They look different, but they're the same size, they do the same damage. And red palm weevil was imported from um, okay, 
red palm weevil was imported from the Middle East, and South American palm <coughs> weevil is much more in South America. So their geographic range is different, but they really have a similar biology and similar damage. What you have here is a photo taken by Mark Hoddle of some South American palm weevil damage down in Tijuana. And um, you can see the normal palm tree here healthy, and then you can see a flat top on the top of that one in the background. And all of our South American palm weevil and our red palm weevil that have been found in California have been negative for the nematode that carries red ring disease. But we're still looking out for that every time we find a uh, red palm weevil or South American palm weevil, the CDFA tests it for this nematode. Um, so they have the normal, uh, you know, egg, larva, pupa, adult, and they're extremely large. Um, they, I would think as a child um, coming from the Middle East, if I had to, if I went on a vacation in the Middle East, I would have picked up some pupae and thought they were really cool because they're about as big as, you know, three to four uh, centimeters, and uh, in there is this gorgeous creature, you know, it's really a beautiful weevil. And so as far as being transported, I can see some kid just really liking that, you know. And I bet that if we find weevils around more, we'll find that residences will be the first ones to call in because their kid will bring in this thing and go, wow, this is the coolest bug. Because they're they're huge. They're you know four centimeters long. Uh, they've got bright colors. They're um, many different types with the red palm weevil. Many different types of colors. The South American palm weevil is kind of boring. It's black, but it's huge nonetheless. So uh, it's bigger than the yucca weevil, which is common in our native yuccas, but it's, it's really gigantic, so I expect people would call in. Now if you ever see fronds, uh, from one of the ways that you can diagnose a tree is the fronds fall off and they'll, ha they'll be littered with feeding holes and pupation chambers. And um, so you, if you see any damage to a, a palm frond that's happened to fall down off, off of a tree, and it has, it's littered with holes like this, it's very likely palm weevil damage. And, and sometimes the pupae will actually fall on the ground, so you'll find those big, massy, grass-covered pupae um, on the, around the base of the tree. So uh, keep an eye out for that, and Pat will show you that palm weevil damage happens on the top, fusarium happens on the bottom leaves. So if you see the fusarium symptoms, you know it's a disease. But if you see something happening, these show desiccated fronds coming out of the big apical meristem, You're, you know that you likely have uh, palm weevil. It's one of the main symptoms. So uh, the next thing that we just want to cover is the latest knowledge about what firewood constitutes as far as a hazard when you transport it. And there's just a myriad of pests. I'm only going to cover the local two uh, in detail, but uh, there's the ambrosia beetle from, uh, Red Bay ambrosia beetle from Florida that we're worried about, <coughs> which is a pest of avocados also. But this don'tmovefirewood.org has a whole list of pests that are in firewood and uh, that are, I think the USDA is trying to get a national um, sort of proclamation together about not moving firewood. Is that a pamphlet available to us somewhere? On this, on this, I took this, I spliced this together from the webpage, it's don'tmovefirewood.org, and these, the, and um, put it together. Myself, so this is not. It's not a. Uh, does this don't move firewood apply to the bundles that are in supermarkets? No. I get that question. It doesn't. When it's debarked, it's almost all and dried. It's almost always safe if it's cured. Yeah. Now. Um, 
Our borer issues in San Diego is gold spotted oak borer and our the other one is Philippicus shot hole borer, which is not in San Diego yet, but it's in Los Angeles County, and so we're look, we're keeping an eye out for it. Um, with the gold spotted oak borer, you can tell if it's gold spotted oak borer damage because the cambium has all these black spots if you do a cross section. And the problem with this is that because the oak borer larvae live in this interface so deep inside the bark that that spongy bark can support them for up to two years. If you just fall, fell a tree, they can be in there for two years before they finish their development and emerge. So the Forest Service is recommending that unless you can debark the oak or let it dry for two years so that it, the, it dries, there's no uh, risk of having any more bugs emerge from it. Um, and the gold spotted oak borer host range is mo mainly limited to these oaks. The polyphagous shot hole borer, because right now is thought to enjoy uh, living and spreading the fusarium disease into these street trees that are common in Southern California. And um, how an ambrosia beetle lives is just, this is different species of ambrosia beetle, but what they do is inoculate a chamber with fungus a few days before they lay their, before their eggs are scheduled to hatch. And so the fungus gets growing and their, their children live on the fungus that they inoculated on the chamber. But sometimes those, those fungi can be a pathogen to the tree. So in this case, with the polyphagous shot hole borer and the red bay and ferocia beetle, they have those chambers and they're feeding the larvae fungus, and Pat can tell you about how that's dangerous to the tree. So it's not only the mechanical damage that the, the borer does, but it's the fungal damage. And there's a picture of gold spotted oak borer up here with the larvae. And what you need to be looking for when you're out cruising around is big patch, they're called patch kills, but I call them big black spots on the main stem of a oak tree. And it has to be a pretty good stem, eight inches in diameter at or more. They really like old trees. And they're just, you know, big black oozing spots. And that's when your antenna should go up for gold spotted oak borer. Right now in San Diego County, um, and there is actually, as of today, one sighting of gold spotted oak borer in Riverside County in Idlewild, um, is all of uh, the Cleveland National Forest extending to Julian and parts of Ramona, as well as Alpine. And then there's a satellite colony of gold spotted oak borer in Marion Bear Regional Park, which is off of Route 52. So if you want to go see what it looks like, the closest place is Marion Bear. And um, the other, <coughs> the Polyphagus shot hole borer, again, both of these animals have excellent websites put together by the university. And Jan Gonzalez, who works out of this office, is doing the gold spotted oak borer. She does a fabulous job. And then the polyphagous shot hole borer is done by UCR, but there is tons of information about these bugs. And with the polyphagous shot hole borer, of course, the main reason it's really causing alarm is because of the avocado growers see that avocado is a host of this critter. And in this case, they have, there's many more pictures online, but you can see they also, it also has spots along a normal trunk. But this, in this case with avocado, it's sort of like a white fungus coming out of the spot. And, but anytime you see any spotting on a bolus, I think that's due for looking at closer to see if you can see any insect holes. And of course, the gold spotted oak borer has much bigger holes, D-shaped, because it's a bucrested, and they make D-shaped exit holes. 
But this little guy has, it's basically needle size, pin size uh, uh, holes that are very, you know, you have to get up with a magnifier. So that's the wonderful news about horrors in the county. <laughs> Both attack oak. <laughs> And this is our number for Cal, uh, I think Pat has the same number in her slide. If there's something where you can't reach Pat or I in for, you know, citrus screening or uh, somebody wants a survey done on their property for citrus psyllid, the hotline will take the call. And uh, this, these are for, this hotline is for the pest du jour. The, you know, the real hot items, like right now we have Asian citrus psyllid and Wang Long Bing and the palm weevil. Uh, it's not for gold spotted oak borer. Send them to the university web page. This is for quarantine, the major quarantine issues of our day, which change every three months. And uh, if not, just have them go ahead and, and send a sample. You're all, yes, sir? Is this number working? Yes, it's a statewide number, and like I said, they switched the pest. Uh, it used to be diacrepes. It used it will be a me if you ever think you have Mexican fruit fly, anything of U.S. quarantine importance, you can call this number. If not, you all know how to explain to people how to take a sample and bring it in either to yourselves or to us <coughs> for diagnostics and. Uh, we rarely like to do diagnostics over the phone. <laughs> Just gets really complicated, as I'm sure you know. We really like to see the sample. And rarely like to do photographic diagnostics, too, because, I don't know, some, there are very few people who are really good photographers. <laughs> Tracy? Yes. Um, you have three Quercus species listed. Um, why? <coughs> This is, in fact, those three and not others. Well, those are the most predominant ones. What about it's, Engelman? It, they do affect Engelman, oh, okay. but it's just that those are the ones that they're most predominant in. It used to be thought that Engelman was somehow immune, but it's really not. If there's a big enough population on those other species, which they prefer, and an Engelman sitting there, and they don't, they're lazy, they like to go as close as they can to the next host, um, they'll attack the Engelman. So they have observed it. It's just less, uh, you know, likable. And I don't know why, and I think somebody might be looking into that, why, you know, there's differences. But they can't even figure out what attracts the beetle to make a good trap for it. So it's hard to say how they would figure out, you know, that too. Question? Yes. Um, back to the blessing instructions yes. for a moment. I was in Napa a month ago, and one of the tour guides told us oh so proudly they're using doggies to find blessing instructions and that they're trained to find them and eradicate them. The dog guys, have you heard of it? I've heard of, I've heard, there's been a lot of, it's a dog using dog sniffing for detecting pests, and I've heard of it for, um, for stress induced by mealybugs, but I've never heard it from glassy wing well, or Pierce's disease. Weird, so I didn't know if yeah. I it or not. There is, I've heard it for mealybugs and grapes, so I think that that might be uh, what they were referring to. I can smell mealybugs. <laughs> 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 oh, very distinctive. Well, there you go. <laughs> then just let the dog do the work for you. <laughs> yeah, I have heard. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, and just so that you know, uh, you know, we're available if you have, there's a million different insects that we're dealing with right now. If you want to get caught up on one or another, just let me know, and I can do private uh, tutorials. <laughs> or we can come back. Pat just wanted to have me come speak to you, introduce myself so that you know who is replaced Dr. Kellum sort of, you know, took his position or whatever. And uh, that you can ask questions about what the local problem is or have a problem. How do we get in touch with you? We come to the front desk at the um, uh, Ag Weights and Measures, as you would for Pat, or you can um, email me or call my desk. 
We have your number in the hotline office. Good. <laughs> and Ian, I want to introduce Ian. Ian is the new um, insect detection specialist who actually has a degree in entomology and he's been a really big help since Dr. Kellen retired. And Bonnie is working for Pat as a, a temporary worker. We hope to have her as a permanent. But it's, you know, we're trying to cope with uh, Dr. Kellen. <laughs> and then um, the next one is just to thank you for attending and thank you for your service to the community in all of what you do with your educational outreach. It might not be the fa most favorite part of your job, but we certainly appreciate being able to refer people to you for advice and recommendations and your knowledge. Um, and so, and we want to be of help to you in getting the word out to everybody about all these different pests. I do have a question. On Asian Sip facilities, your trees have been identified without that. Uh -huh. What do you do with the debris when you're tree training and the food that you're not supposed to eat? I had that question come up with the Master Gardener exhibit. Right now, um, because the whole area is under quarantine, uh, You'd be hard pressed unless you put it in your car and you drove up to Ventura County. Uh, you know, you would be hard pressed to be being illegal with your green waste. But what happens is when you have a find at your site, and the rules keep changing, the CDFA will talk to you personally. They'll say you need to put this in a green waste container that's going to go to the dump or compost it on site. They won't. They they really encourage you not to move it, and so the best way is just put it. Find a way to get it to the dump, and if you don't have a recycle bin or you know green waste to the dump, then you you have to um, compost it on site. So they will they will give you the guidelines if you're a fine site. They will give you the guidelines for what they are doing. But because the whole area is under quarantine, you know, we don't want you moving it, but you would not be breaking the law by moving it. You just, it's, it's out of your goodwill that you keep it where you find it. These yeah. tree trimmings are only if you have the insect? Yeah, you that's what she's talking it. about, if it's in your yard. Found it. And, and hopefully, in the, in CDFA will treat your yard right, right now in San Diego County, although it might not if we get a virgin burgeoning population we won't the cdfa will drop all treatments um like in la and orange and riverside counties but if if you're right now and you have your fine site they will treat your tree with uh, contact poison and imidacloprid to um to uh, resist the insect Yes, ma'am. Uh, could you tell me what is the treatment for that olive psyllis? You know, I'm not exactly sure. You would have to look. I'm not sure that the university has recommended anything yet. And uh, so I don't give recommendations. I give recommendations from the university. So I rely on the same material that you rely on for, you know, information to the public. Except I can say certain things like, uh, you know, I can use common sense things like spray it with water or, you know, things that don't involve using pesticides or trimming it or whatever. I can give those suggestions. But I go by the same guidelines you do based on university research. So. Um, the palm weevils, are there any particular kinds of palms that are attacked? I am sorry I went rushed through that. Um, what we're looking at, the best thing to scope out when you're driving around is Canary Island date palm. And, and again, it's the top part, the apical meristem, that you're going to be looking at. And I happen to know that there's an area in Encinitas, Carlsbad, that people keep reporting and it's some other something, but the, the trees look flat-topped. Um, the, the fines have been in San Ysidro. They're blowing over from Tijuana um, and, the, and along the Mexican border in Texas, too, so for South American palm weevil. Red 
palm weevil was just an isolated incident. Somehow somebody brought it from the Middle East into Orange County. Like I said, brought it as a pet and then, you know, thought it was cute. Or don't whatever. subcultures eat it? Yeah, it's a it's, it's a, one it's, of those yeah. you, entomophagy, you know, is presented for that. It's a big grub and people like it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, it's huge. So yes. <laughs> Two to three years. Yeah, they really do kill it. Yeah, and, and the way that people noticed it in Orange County was the top fell off. I mean, it just, it, and what they do is they're, they're very lazy and they'll just keep laying eggs in that same tree and just m make that middle part into a mush mesh mess and it stinks apparently it stinks like something you've never smelled before mm -hmm. and uh, if they just sit there and riddle the inside and make it into this mash and uh, and then it just falls over so if you if the first parts of it are just the top of the first leaves so any other questions doesn't that kill the palm? Then? Yeah, of course. The top falls off. Yeah. It's a huge, huge, huge problem in the Middle East. Um, and the other thing about the Middle East that I wanted to say is that Asian citrusylid parasites that they're releasing in LA to combat Asian citrusylid are from Pakistan, just so that you know. Um, so if the damage is at the top, you're saying you can tell if you have it, if it's not real bad, if, because the fronds fall off and you see the holes in the fronds? I think that it would have to be bad by the time you see the frond holes, because that means that it has eaten through a frond and a frond's sick enough to fall off. Yeah, right. um, so, but sometimes it's not even diagnosed until, like I said, until the top fell off in Orange County. The homeowner it, or the person that saw it first didn't call it in, the tree care company or whatever, didn't call it in until the top fell off. But so, you said mostly in Canary Island date palms? That's the one to look for, yes. They find those most attractive. And Washingtonian aren't, as, aren't very susceptible at all, the, the native Washingtonian. You know that uh, the olive that breaks up on the olive? Yes. You no, know, my neighbor had it, and I, we were trying to get it off, and I, we just took 90% of rubbing alcohol and put it in a spray bottle, and by the third time you spray it, it's all gone. Okay. I would never tell somebody to do that. <laughs> but you, you can, you know, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> will, will that olive still infect other plants? As far as I know, it's very host specific. So, okay. yep. We have a whole bunch of other psyllids that are causing trouble. But. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. And, uh,